Well, my name's Nate. If we don't know each other, I'd love to meet you at some point. I'll be in the lobby after the service. Um, I want to let you know next week uh, is World Outreach Weekend, and would love for you to join us for that. Uh, pastor Ilya, who is a pastor um, at, a, at a church that we support in Poland, where he ministers to um, Ukrainian refugees, uh, he will be preaching next Sunday on Acts chapter 16, continuing our Acts series, and I'm excited for you to hear from him. Um, and we'll also be praying and commissioning some missionaries, so um, it would be awesome for you to be here for that. Uh, today we're picking up where we left off in Acts chapter 15. So if you have a Bible, um, would you open with me to Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 36. This is on page 982 in the Bible that's provided there. We've been uh, going through the book of Acts, and Acts is just a book in the Bible that tells the history of the early church. It helps answer the question, how did the message of Jesus go from this small group of people in Jerusalem to spreading throughout the Roman Empire? And what we're seeing is that the, the theme of this book is that God is on a mission to send and to save. God the Father has sent his son Jesus to the earth. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit and is sending the church to the ends of the earth so that all the peoples of the earth might be saved through faith in Jesus. And the message throughout Acts that we've seen so far has been spreading and that all led to this big meeting that we talked about last week in Acts chapter 15. This is a meeting that has gone down in history as being called the Jerusalem Council. It's where the whole church met together to figure out, okay, so our non-Jewish people who believe in Jesus, do they need to become Jewish? Do they need to be circumcised and follow the law in order to be real Christians? And the answer coming out of the Jerusalem Council was no, they don't. Everybody is saved in the same way through the grace of God displayed in Jesus by believing in Jesus, that's how everyone is saved. And so there's this remarkable unity that comes um, from the, uh, the meeting that we talked about last week, the Jerusalem Council. There's this remarkable unity and there's now clarity around the message. There's clarity on the gospel. And so you would think that everything would be really smooth sailing from this point forward since there's such clarity around the gospel, right? And that's not what happens at all. Instead, immediately after this meeting, they have this debate about methodology. See, the Jerusalem council was all about theology. Theology is just what we believe about God. What we believe about God. And so it helped answer the question, who is God and who are we and how do we live rightly with God and with one another? But now is a debate about methodology. And methodology is, how are we actually going to go about spreading the gospel? What should we actually do? Who should go with us and what should our strategy be? And that is where the debate is had. And have we reached consensus on this today? No. In fact, maybe that's one of the things that is hard for you about the Christian faith. If God is true, and if we supposedly know him, and if we are being led by the spirit of God, why are there all these disagreements? Why are there all these different kinds of churches? Why are there all these different approaches to things? Why don't we all just think the same about everything if God is really among us? And I think that's an important question. Is it okay for there to be differences amongst Christians? Is it okay for us to have differences with other churches in how we go about doing things? Is that okay? And why is that the case? That there are differences. Today's text helps us, I think, have some wisdom for answering that question. And so uh, what we're gonna do is look at each of these two scenes. Uh, Verse 36 through 41 is scene one. Chapter 16, verse one through verse five is scene two. We're gonna look at each of these scenes and then see what we can learn about living with discernment over our methodology today. So let's take a look. The first scene is a huge debate about methodology. Look at verse 36. After some time passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. 
And that seems like a great idea. We planted these churches together. We want to check in, see how they're doing. We want to deliver the message that just was reached from the Jerusalem council. So let's do it. Barnabas is like, that's awesome. I, would, I love that idea. I've been praying about the same thing. Let's do that. Um, verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take along John, John, who was called Mark. And Paul Verse 38, insisted that they should not take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. Now, if you remember, in Acts chapter 13, when they, Paul and Barnabas go, they take John Mark with them. And then in chapter 13, verse 13, it tells us that when they were in Pamphylia, John left them and went back to Jerusalem. And we're not told why he left, but he left right before things got really ugly. Paul is about to be beaten and stoned. He's about to be cast out of cities. He's about to be chased down by rioting mobs. And Mark missed all of that because he had already gone home. And the team hadn't decided, you know what? We should all go home. Mark just decided he's going home. He left us. So Barnabas is like, all right, we're getting the team back together. Uh, Mark's on the team, right? Because he left with us before. And Paul's going, he's not on the team anymore. He left the team. And who's right? Can you relate to each of their sides? Do you understand each of their, their arguments here? Let's think about it from Barnabas's perspective for a minute. Mark ought to come with us because yeah, he left us before, but the message that we're going to proclaim is a message of grace and forgiveness and second chances. Of course, Mark should be able to have another chance to be on the team. Of course. And Paul's going, well, I'm not questioning if he can be a Christian or if God can forgive him or if he's worthy of grace. I'm, I'm questioning if he's the right person to be on our team right now because He left us before. And one of the things that we're going to have to go do on this journey is tell people that you've got to endure hardship to enter the kingdom of God. It tells us that's what Paul's message was to the churches in Acts chapter 14. So we're going to be going and telling that message. And one of the people on our team is a guy who hasn't endured hardship and left. He's not going to be able to be an example to the churches. And so he can't come. And Barnabas is going, yeah, but, but which of us wasn't at one time not worthy of being an example for the churches? I mean, think about Peter. Peter is the leader of the whole movement. And right before Jesus went to the cross, Peter denied him three times. And Barnabas says, Paul, I don't want to get too personal here, but think about your story. You were persecuting the church. And if it was up to the church they would have never welcomed you in. They wouldn't have brought you in and allowed you to start doing ministry here. But who came alongside you and advocated for you? Who came alongside you and said, you ought to really give this this Paul guy a chance? It was me, Barnabas says. Who gave you the ministry platform that you have? I did, and it was because I I was operating with the same principles I'm operating with now for Mark. And Paul's going, look, I appreciate what you did for me. But I'm not disputing if Mark has a promising future or if he can be very fruitful in ministry down the road. I'm saying right now, I don't feel comfortable going with him and I don't want us to take him. And they disagree. And so verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended by the brothers and sisters to the grace of the Lord. He traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Who's right? Luke doesn't tell us. Luke is the one who is recording this for us. And he doesn't tell us. Luke is going to follow Paul's missionary journey from this point forward. So the the action is going to center around Paul But the ultimate result is that two missions teams are sent out now rather than just one. And what 
Luke is going to highlight is that the gospel spreads, but he does not choose a side. And that's an important thing to notice in the text. So that's scene one. There's a debate about methodology. Now let's look at scene two. And there's surprising methodology. Paul, chapter 16, verse one. Paul went on to Derby and Lystra where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. And the point in telling us that is that he's not circumcised. And if that feels awkward and weird, listen to last week's message. We explain why that's a big deal. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him. So he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now this is a surprising choice. And here's why. Because who was the most adamant that you don't have to be circumcised? Paul. The whole reason that the Jerusalem council was called is because Paul would not back down on this point. You do not have to be circumcised to be a Christian. You do not have to become Jewish to be a Christian. And then right after they've made the decision that you're right, he's forcing Timothy to get circumcised. Did he forget what the council had just decided? No, because of verse four, as they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. So they are announcing the decision, you don't have to be circumcised, while he's requiring Timothy to be circumcised to come with them. What in the world? It's surprising methodology. But the result, verse five, is the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. So why did Paul do that? We'll talk about that in a second. But what I want you to see is that he's having to think He's having to use discernment over his methodology. And so what can we learn about methodology today? What can we learn about differences that we have? And what can we learn about how to make wise decisions as we go about trying to spread the news about Jesus? What can we learn from this text? There are two things that I want us to see. First, Notice that before there is debate about methodology, there is clarity on the gospel. Before there is debate about methodology, there is clarity on the gospel. The dispute between Paul and Barnabas over whether or not Mark should come follows this very unified decision that we're all in alignment about what we believe the gospel is. We have clarity around the message of Jesus. And what was the clarity that they reached? Before we can begin talking about practical concerns, which is where we live, before we can begin addressing practical concerns and thinking through how to make practical decisions, let's make sure that we have clarity around the gospel. Do you know what the gospel is? And here's what the, the council concluded. This is chapter 15. Verse nine, this is Peter speaking and he says, God made no distinction between us and them, between Jews and Gentiles, between people with the law and people without the law. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. He says in verse 11, we believe that we are saved through the grace of of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. This is the conclusion that they come to. Now let's piece together what this message is then. The message of the gospel, clarity around the gospel, the good news of Jesus says this, that God is clean and I am unclean and I need to be made clean and I need God to be the one to make me clean. That's the gospel. God is clean. He's the one who made us. He's the one who knows what's best for us. In him, there is no darkness at all. 
In him, there is beauty and goodness and truth. He's clean. Our basic problem is that we are unclean. That's why he says in verse nine, what we needed was our hearts to be cleansed. We're unclean. And the reason that we're unclean is because we've left God. Each of us have decided that we would be better off without him. My life would be better. I would be happier. The world would function better if we thought about things on our own and we ignored the wisdom of God. That's the essence of sin. And that's what we do every single time that we're guilty of it. And so we become unclean. We need to be made clean. That's the only way for life and flourishing to happen is if we are made clean is the metaphor being used. And so how could we go about making ourselves clean? There are all kinds of answers to that question. All of them will become a burden to you. And that burden will crush you. If you and I are responsible for making ourselves clean, that burden will crush us. But that is not the gospel. Here's the gospel. We said last week, the gospel frees us from the burden of having to measure up. And here's why. Because the gospel says, you need to be made clean but you need Jesus to do it for you. You can't do it yourself. And the good news is that Jesus has done something to make you clean. Jesus, the one who is clean, became unclean so that you, by his uncleanliness, could become clean. The good news of the gospel is that what you need most is available not through your own strength and your own performance, but what you need most is available to you in Jesus Christ alone. He died on the cross for your sins. He raised from the dead to offer you the hope of new life. And he will return again to make all things clean. So trust in him. That's the gospel. Have you received that message? Have you believed that message? When you think about what you must do to approach God, do you have a list that crushes you? Or do you cling simply to the fact that Jesus, Jesus can make me clean? That's the gospel. It's clarity around that message that they strive for at the Jerusalem Council. And before they have any debates about methodology, they are clear on that. And we must be clear on that as well. Out from the gospel flows the rest of our theology. So when we talk about having clarity around the gospel, we're saying we want to make sure we, we hold on to that message, the message of Jesus. And attached to that message are other things that we would call theological categories or theology that we also want to hold on to. So when we talk about clarity around the gospel, we're also talking about some theological convictions. Now, if as soon as I say the word theology or theological conviction, you feel like this is not for me, this is over my head, I'm not a theology person. Listen, that is not true. You do theology all the time. Theology is simply thinking thoughts about God. That's all that theology is. Every time you have a thought about God, you're doing theology. And the gospel actually provides the stream from which your theology should flow. Um, Kevin Van Hooser, Dr. Kevin Van Hooser, who's a brilliant theologian, has a little book and in it, he makes this claim that theology, Christian theology ultimately flows from the question that Jesus asks his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He says, theology ultimately just comes from that one question. Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus? And it's by asking that question, who is Jesus, that you inevitably end up talking about doctrines or theologies that we would call the doctrine of God, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of humanity. Just by talking about who is Jesus, you have to talk about who God is and who mankind is. 
and how God, if there's one God, could have a son By asking the question, how can we know Jesus and have fellowship with him? You're inevitably going to talk about the doctrine of scripture and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. By asking the question, why did Jesus have to die? You're inevitably going to talk about the doctrine of sin. By asking the question, how can we benefit from Jesus' suffering? You're going to talk about the doctrine of salvation. By asking the question, how does he make us a community? How does Jesus make us into a people? You're going to start talking about the church. And by asking the question, what will Jesus do when he returns, you're inevitably going to start talking about the doctrine of the last things, or what we call eschatology. My point in sharing this is just to show you that when when we talk about theology, we're not talking about some abstract thing, we're talking about Jesus. And we're doing reflection on who Jesus is and what Jesus' work is. And Jesus is how we come to rightly understand who God is and who we are and how we ought to live. And so before we debate methodology, we should have clarity around the gospel. And that means we should also have some clarity around some doctrine, some belief, some theology. And when it comes to thinking through theology, there are so many differences. How do you know which differences are worth fighting over and which are worth compromising over? And that's an important question. In order to think through that question, there's a professor who has coined a term um, called theological triage. Theological triage. Now, uh, he introduces this term through an illustration of going to the emergency room. And he talks about how he goes to the emergency room and they have a triage system where they respond to the most urgent matters with the most urgency. And he talks about how prior to, the, the, uh, prior to hospitals developing a triage system, it was just mass chaos and there were needlessly people who were losing their lives because it was a first come first serve basis kind of thing. And if you come in and you don't have some kind of uh, life threatening situation, you were still being given attention. While meanwhile, there was a life threatening situation over here that needed to be addressed and wasn't. And so triage actually solves that or works to solve that. And he says the same thing needs to be true of how we approach theology. We need some type of of triage system so that we can have the most urgent debates about the most urgent matters and we can have open hands to less urgent, less essential matters. And so he introduces this concept of three orders of Christian doctrine. So here's a triangle on the screen for you to help you think through this, to help you visualize it. So at the top, there are first order issues. These are issues where disagreement would lead you to be part of a different faith altogether. These are things like the fact that there is one God who eternally exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are doctrines like the fact that Jesus is truly God and truly man, that Jesus really died, that he really rose from the dead, that he really will return to judge the living and the dead, that people are saved through his shed blood by grace alone, and that the scripture has authority. These are first order doctrines. And this is where sometimes the critique that, well, Christians don't agree on anything and there's not such thing as the Christian faith. There's the Christian faiths because there's so many different versions of Christianity. Who can even know what's true? That's where that actually starts to lose a lot of credibility when you think about actually how much unity there is across time and across space around some of these, those first order issues that I just said. Throughout time and throughout space, the church has affirmed that there is one God in three persons, that Jesus is truly man and truly God, that he really died, really rose from the dead, will return to judge, that we are saved by grace, and that the scripture has authority over our lives. These are first order issues. That is, these are issues that we must contend for with most urgency. Then there are also second order issues. This is where a disagreement will lead you to be part of a different church, but not question if this person is a Christian. 
But practically speaking, there are some issues that it's just going to be hard to be in the same church if we disagree over these things. The most classic example is baptism. Who is supposed to be baptized? Believers or believers and their children. You're either going to decide one of those things. You're either going to baptize only believers or you're also going to baptize their kids. And so it's going to be hard to maintain unity in a church if you're disagreeing over that. So that's a second order issue. It's going to probably lead you to be part of a different church. Same with elements of church governance. But then there are also third order issues, this theologian says. These are issues where we can have serious disagreement, but we could still fellowship together in the same church. We can agree to disagree over these issues. Um, For example, this would be something like your view of the end times or how you interpret the millennium passage in the book of Revelation. This is just a recognition that there are some teachings of scripture that are clearer than others and that are more essential to preserving the gospel that was fought over in Acts 15. There are some doctrines that are more essential to maintain the integrity of the gospel than others. And here's why this matters. Here's why I'm sharing all of this with you. Because when I talk about having clarity on the gospel, I'm talking about first order issues. I'm not even talking about second order or third order issues when I talk about we need to have clarity around the gospel. Um, There is a thing called theological liberalism. In theological liberalism, everything is a third order issue. We can agree to disagree on everything. Everything is open-handed. We want to avoid theological liberalism. We also want to avoid a thing called theological fundamentalism. In theological fundamentalism, everything is a first order issue. There's no room at all for disagreement on anything because everything I believe is a major point. One pastor describes it like this. Pride will lead you to be dogmatic about every point of belief. You cannot distinguish between major and minor points because everything you believe is major. We want to avoid that as well. We want to have boldness to stand by convictions, even convictions on second order issues and third order issues, and yet also have the humility to recognize that not everything is a major point and I could be wrong. That's the kind of church historically that Highlands has been. Close handed on first order issues and very humble on second and third order issues. Now, let's bring this back to our text. After they have clarity around the gospel, then they begin to have difference of opinion over methodology. And here's what I want you to see. Here's the second point. That when you have clarity on the gospel, there is freedom over methodology. When you have clarity on the gospel, there is freedom over methodology. Paul and Barnabas have a debate. Who was right? Luke doesn't tell us. Isn't that fascinating? In a culture where you have to have an opinion about everything, You've got to make a judgment about what's right and what's wrong about everything. Luke doesn't tell us. Is there something we can learn from that? That maybe there is freedom for them to disagree about the right path forward. And notice, too, that even in their disagreement, they had love and respect for one another. How do I know that? Because Paul will write about Barnabas in the New Testament, and he will also write about Mark three different times in the book of Colossians, Philemon, and 2 Timothy. And all three times when he talks about Mark, he speaks about him positively, and he talks about how he has a fruitful, useful ministry. So Paul is not holding a grudge here against Mark. It's just a disagreement over the right path forward. But they're still operating with love and respect for one another. And then, in scene two, when Paul goes and has Timothy circumcised, it's really interesting. 
In the book of Galatians, um, Galatians chapter two, verse three, Paul's writing and he says, but not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. Paul references this other situation with Titus, not Timothy, and he says, I didn't make Titus become circumcised. And he goes on to say, if you go and get circumcised, you might as well throw Christ out because Christ will be of no value to you. Now, cynical, skeptical people look at that and say, look, Paul's a hypocrite. Or Paul changed his mind. He didn't have Titus get circumcised, but now he's going to force Timothy to be circumcised. Or Paul's caving in here and he's lost his conviction to have Timothy circumcised. What's the difference between Titus and Timothy, Paul? And do you know what I think the answer is? Luke doesn't tell us. (laughs) He doesn't tell us. And do you know what that means? It means there's freedom over methodology. You could look at Paul cynically and say, he's a hypocrite, he's inconsistent. Or you could look at him charitably and say, he's flexible. He's flexible. There are some times where this seems like the wise thing to do, and there are other times where this seems like the wise thing to do. Now, I have my own theories about the difference in the Timothy and Titus situation. I think for Titus, it was people inside the church saying, he's got to become circumcised or he's not a real Christian. And Paul's like, we are not putting up with that for a second. That's nonsense. But then with Timothy, he's thinking about people outside the church. He wants Timothy to be effective in ministering to non-Jewish people or to Jewish people. And so he wants to become like a Jew to those people. Let's not cause unnecessary offense. I think that's the difference. But do you see how there's flexibility for him to go about his methodology differently depending on the the situation? There's freedom over methodology when you have clarity on the gospel. And this means that even people who are full of the Holy Spirit may disagree. See, um, throughout the book of Acts, Barnabas is referred to as a man full of the Holy Spirit. That's how Paul's described too. And Luke does not weigh in to say, but Barnabas didn't have the spirit here. Or vice versa, which means even people who are being led by the Holy Spirit, who are doing their best to discern what does scripture say and what would be the best thing, may disagree. There's freedom over methodology when you have clarity on the gospel. And this is what the church has historically affirmed. Um, I'm gonna show you a, a lengthy Uh, section from the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is um, a document that a bunch of pastors wrote in the 1600s. And uh, in uh, chapter 1.6, here's what it says. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture. Now, look at this for just a minute. They're claiming that scripture itself tells us everything that we need to know. It is sufficient so that we might be able to glorify God and be saved through faith in Jesus. That is sufficient in scripture. Scripture tells us what we need to know. Or it could be deduced from scripture by good and necessary consequence. Nevertheless, they go on. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. In other words, just because it's clear doesn't mean we're getting rid of the role of the Holy Spirit to illuminate us, to help us to turn on the lights so that we can see the truth that's in Scripture. We still need the Spirit of God to do that. And here's their further clarification. And that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and government of the church common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word which are always to be observed. Do you see what they're saying? They have wisdom to recognize scripture is sufficient if you want to obey God. But 
Scripture doesn't cover everything. And there are so many things that must be left up to what they call the light of nature and Christian prudence. What seems wise to do? There are so many decisions that fall into that category, they say. So 10 a.m. is a great time to have a church service. There's not a Bible verse that says Sundays at 10 a.m. is when you've got to meet. But the light of nature and Christian prudence says it's better than 2.30 a.m. Now we could make some arguments for, you know, if people are really committed to God, they'll get up, you know. But you could look at the light of nature and Christian prudence and say, yeah, but come on. Like, isn't it going to be way better just to meet at a, a time that's convenient for the most amount of people? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. That's the light of nature and Christian prudence. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is just to show you that this is not like just me trying to pick and choose like, oh, do whatever you want. This is thoughtful Christians who take the Bible so seriously, recognizing the Bible is not clear about everything. And so there's got to be some freedom over methodology. And this is uh, something that our elders also try to practice. We have something that we operate with called the dip theory. And this has been at Highlands for a few decades, maybe a couple decades at least. Um, The dip theory is just direct principle, indirect principle, and preference. The direct principle is, does scripture address this directly? If so, let's obey and do exactly what scripture says. Indirect principle is, does scripture address this indirectly? Are there principles that weigh in heavily onto this particular issue that we have to consider? And then finally, preference. Do we have freedom just to do what seems best? There is, what kind of carpet should we have at a church? Can you have carpet? I mean, let's start there. Is there a Bible verse that says you can have carpet? There are people who try to say, well, the crimson blood of Christ, have red carpet. Um, but can we just acknowledge there's not a Bible verse that says you gotta have this color carpet. That's a preference. There's wisdom in being able to recognize the freedom that exists in methodology. And here's why this might matter for you. Because there are all kinds of dilemmas that you face too. What kind of school should you send your kids to? Should you do public school, private school, or, or homeschool? What parenting philosophy should you adopt? How should you engage in Bible reading? What time of day is most righteous for you to do your Bible reading? What plan do you need to follow in your Bible reading? How should you order your prayer life? How should you live out your faith at work? Where should you direct your giving? How much should you give? How should you go about sharing the gospel with your neighbors? How should you practice fellowship with other believers? How should you utilize social media? Those are important questions. There's not a Bible verse that says, here's how you've got to do it, which means that we've got to have love and respect for one another when we have differences over these kinds of things. And we've got to try and use wisdom and discernment derived from scripture to help us make these kinds of decisions, recognizing that there will be freedom and there will be disagreement, even by people who are led by the spirit of God. So to close today, I wanna share six questions with you that I hope could be useful in trying to think through discerning these kinds of things. First, is there a biblical, a direct biblical command to obey? Is there a direct biblical command to obey? The Bible is clear about lots of stuff. You should honor your parents. You should tell the truth. You should treat your neighbor with love and respect. Don't steal, but be generous. Be sexually pure. Be faithful to your spouse. The most important decision before any decision in your life is this decision. Whose authority are you going to live by? Does God have authority over your life? 
Does God's word have authority over your life? That's the most important decision. That's the decision before every other decision. In Paul and Barnabas' case, has God said if Mark is supposed to go along on the journey? No. But let's not move past question one too quickly. The Bible is clear. It's not God's will for you to steal something so that you can give all this money to missions. We're going to fund missions through the money laundering scheme that I've dreamed up. It's it's not God's will. He's covered that one. We're going to lie, but by lying, it's going to open the door to... Has God already covered this one? Number two. What biblical principles should inform your approach? What biblical principles should inform your approach? Think about Barnabas and Paul for a minute. What are the the principles that Barnabas is operating by? God has mercy for sinners. God gives second chances. God has forgiveness and grace. What about Paul? God values perseverance and wisdom and being an example as leaders. And it doesn't make sense to put somebody in a position of leadership that has proved that they, they aren't worthy of that position. This can be a learning experience. Uh, it's not really the kind of position that you need right now to have a learning experience. It's not that he can't go on a future trip, but he can't go on this one. Do you see how even by trying to use biblical principles, it's not crystal clear which one is right? What do they need to do? They need to use wisdom and discernment in order to form their convictions. The same is true for us. When it comes to school choice, you can make an argument. Parents should be the primary disciplers in their kids' lives. And the culture is discipling kids in all kinds of ways. And so homeschool is the best method to make sure that kids receive a Christian worldview. There's wisdom in that. The Bible also says we're supposed to make disciples of all nations. And we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. And so public school is actually the best method to use for your kids, because it allows you to rub shoulders with non-Christians, and you'll have the opportunity to actually get to know people who are different than you, and for your kids to learn how to submit to other authority. It's actually, that's actually the best way. Which one's right? Well, should Mark go on the trip or not? The Bible does not give specific commands about how you're supposed to do that. And that means that there's freedom to choose. And that means that we've got to have love and respect for one another. We don't want to be the homeschool church or the public school church. We're the Jesus church. And we think carefully about those kinds of things. The same with fellowshipping with other believers. Does the, is there a Bible verse that says you've got to be in a community group? No. And so you are not sinning if you're not in a community group. Is there a Bible verse that says you've got to serve on some kind of team at the church? No. And so you're not sinning if you're not part of a team at the church. What the Bible does say is that you've got to be in fellowship with other believers and you're sinning if you're not. And what the Bible does say is that you've been given a gift that you ought to use for the building up of the church and you're sinning if you're not. But that's not the same thing as saying that you've got to follow the pattern that we lay out here in order to do that. And we've got to be clear about that. But because of the way that biblical principles inform us, we think community groups are a really convenient and wise way of practicing some of the one another's of scripture. Same with serving on a team. Number three. Have you thought out the implications of the gospel on this issue? Have you thought out the implications of the gospel on this issue? This is very similar to point two, but it's, it narrows it from the Bible, biblical principles to the gospel. What do we actually see Jesus do in his death and resurrection? And here's why this is helpful, I think. Because there are certain issues where you can justify things with biblical wisdom that 
are not being derived directly from the gospel. I'll give you a really important one, is with money. There are all kinds of biblical principles about stewardship and wise handling of resources, which are excellent. But greed can be justified very quickly in the name of stewardship. And what does the gospel say about what to do with money? The gospel says, be generous, dude. Be generous. Do not build bigger barns for yourselves, but think of the one who had his barns torn down and you be rich towards God. This is Paul's reflection in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. He says, look, I can't command you how much to give. This percentage is how much you must give or this amount is how much you must give. He says, I I don't come to you with a command, but instead I come to you with the gospel. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus, right? That though he was rich for your sake, he became poor so that through his poverty, you might become rich. So be a cheerful giver, man. Think about Jesus when it comes to your finances. That's what I mean by thinking out the implications of the gospel on this issue. This is also true for issues like forgiveness. There's lots of wisdom in drawing boundaries around people, boundaries for yourself from people who have hurt you. That is wise and biblical. And yet we cannot allow those boundaries to be an excuse for an unforgiving heart. We are to forgive just as God in Christ forgave us. When we think about marriage, we are not just to think generally about what the Bible says about marriage. Instead, Paul says, here's how you should think about marriage. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How should you relate to your wife? Here's who you should think about when you try to answer that question. You should think about what Jesus did for the church. And if he did it for the church, you should do it for your wife. Number four, what will the effect be on others? What will the effect be on others? Godly wisdom always considers a we, not just a me. That's James 3, 13 through 18. It's the point of that passage. Godly wisdom always considers a we, not just a me. So who is a we that you need to consider? Your family, your church family, other Christians, non-Christians, Who's a we that you need to consider? How will this affect others? Number five. Questions five and six I stole from another pastor. In light of your past experiences, your present circumstances, and your future hopes, what's the wise thing to do? In light of your past experiences, your present circumstances, and your future hopes, what's the wise thing to do? And here's why this is such an excellent question. Because your past is different from somebody else's. And that might make certain things really foolish for you to do based on what you've experienced in the past. That would be totally fine for somebody who hasn't experienced what you've experienced. And your present circumstances are different than somebody else's present circumstances, which would mean that the way that you do some things right now might need to be different than the way somebody else does them because your circumstances are different. And where you want to go in life and where you sense God leading you in life might be different than somebody else, which means that the wise thing for you to do might be different than what's wise for someone else. This is an excellent question to consider. And then number six, are you being honest with yourself? Really? Really? Are you being honest with yourself, really? As you think through the answers to these questions, are you being honest with yourself about your motives behind these decisions, really? Or are you looking to justify something? Are you looking to get away with something? Are you being honest with yourself, really? When we have clarity in the gospel, there can be freedom over our methodology. Would we be a church that has clarity on the gospel? and also freedom for how we apply it. Let me pray for us. Father, we praise you for your word. We praise you for your will that you have revealed to us in your word. God, we praise you for sending us your son. True wisdom incarnate. 
And God, we praise you for giving us your spirit. God, I ask that your spirit would be active now. Help us to live wisely. Help us to make the best use of our time. Help us to grow in wisdom and discernment and love so that we can be the best people possible and make the best decisions possible for your glory and your name to be known among the nations. It's in Jesus' name that I ask. Amen.